now we're going to welcome our guest. And we have Dr. Bristow, as you can see, and I'm actually, while we're recording, I'm going to leave you on the screen, Dr. Bristow, and I am going to take myself off camera in a moment. So I just want to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Bristow Jr. is the Buford Buff Blunt Professor of Military History and a fellow of the Dale Center for the Study of War in the Society of the U University of Southern Mississippi, the Smithsonian, Duke University, and Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library have awarded him with postdoctoral fellowships. He is a member of the editorial board for the Quarterly Journal of the Army War College Parameters. He has published two books, one which you hear about today, and that's The Knights of the Razor, Black Barbers in Slavery and Freedom. And into, the next book is Integrating the U.S. Military Race, Gender, and Sexuality Since World War II. His current book project is Behind the Front Scenes, How Black GIs Helped Win World War II. His interviews have been included in the Christian Science Monitor and the New York Times, along with the PBS documentary, Boss, The Black Experience in Business. So, Dr. Bristol, let me take down the slides. We welcome you and glad to have you here. And we're gonna go ahead and start asking you some questions. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to ask is, tell us about this journey about you writing the book, your interest in the Black Barbers, because you tend to have a military association that you've been writing about. What drew you to the Black Barbers? Um, yeah, you're right to know. By the way, I, first off, I just want to thank everybody for the invitation to be here with the International African American History Museum. It's a very exciting time, just as it's getting ready to open. Um, so thank you for having me on here to talk about this book. Mm -hmm. um, I have more recently moved to the study of war and society because I have colleagues that do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did my dissertation with Ira Berlin, who's really the world he was, he's passed away sadly, the world's foremost uh, authority on the history of slavery in the Americas. And so uh, I, part of what drew me to the story of Black Barbers, it's a story about people going from slavery to freedom and, and how barbering played a role in that. But more basically, here is the thing. There's a very well-known Black sociologist named E. Franklin Frazier. He used to teach at Howard University. He was the president of the American Sociological Association. He's a very prominent a scholar. And he argued that African-Americans simply lacked a tradition of business enterprise, something analogous to, say, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who seemed to really have a knack for going into business. And that just struck me as basically false. Uh, mm -hmm. I was living in Baltimore, Maryland at the time, which is a place full of Black-owned businesses, so that didn't make sense. And so what I did is I started going in the, in the 19th century, especially as your genealogists know, often the best source for information uh, that gets into the day-to-day -day lives, what people did for a living, for example, are in community studies. So a history of, of African-Americans in Baltimore or in Cleveland or so on and so forth. And I just kept checking them out of the library and every single one of them the most successful businessman was always the barber. And I said, now there's really yeah. something going on. And then I looked into it in more detail. And in the colonial times, in the uh, period after the American Revolution, barbering was something that Black men did. They mm -hmm. had a niche for themselves. But then increasingly, they were challenged by German and later Italian immigrants uh, for the business, of course, of cutting the hair uh, and shaving the beards of white men. And what's really remarkable is black barbers competed against white barbers for the business of well-to-do white customers and they won. So there's really no other example of that in the 19th century. So they, they were able to go after the most lucrative part of the market and then they dominated it for a hundred years with this tradition they created of, of first class shops where you were not only just getting a shave and a haircut but you were having this experience of luxury and and being at the center for local, uh, the local notables talk politics and whatnot. So, so in your book, you mentioned, okay, they, they won 
They've got the respect of the people, you know, whose hair they're cutting. I'm going to say the white men. And but the trust factor is what really intrigued me a lot. And if we're talking about slave era time, I just can't imagine a black man standing over a white man sitting in a chair with a razor and there not be an issue. And you mentioned at any time, basically the barber could have slit the throat of that white man. But was there other things that they had in place? You know, I'm not sure the whole trust factor of the white man and the barber, you know, went, were, were they guarded or, or what actually happened while they're in the chair besides the hair cutting and the shaving? You know, were they monitored or, or something? Of, was there fear of, of the white man with the barber with, like I said, the, the razor? Um, so I'm really I'm really glad you you asked about this issue. It's it's the thing you'll learn about on the first page of my book, Knights of the Razor. Uh, and it gets really to the heart of something very important about the relationship between black barbers and their white clients. So first off, I mean, I, I didn't find any Sweeney Todd's, nobody okay. that we I'm know sorry, I did ask was that killing question. their uh, <laughs> killing their customer, although there was a story uh, from New Bern, North Carolina. A, a slave barber named Brister was working in a shop one day and a local uh, physician, Dr. Jones, came in and would, had a big sword and he put it on the table. He said, if you cut me at all, I'm going to cut your throat. And so right, Brister right. very calmly shaves the man. No, nothing, nothing happens. And afterwards, another customer was like, you weren't nervous at all. How did you do that? And he said, well, I resolved that if I nicked him at all, I'd just go ahead and kill him. Um, but so, so there's some, we, there are some interesting anecdotes, but the, here's the real thing that we're learning from that story. Mm -hmm. As you said, you would think that the last thing racist white slave owners would mm -hmm. want to do would be to bear their throat um, to the mercy of a black man who could so easily, because they're using straight edge razors. And that, that's the main thing you went to a barbershop for. If you look at the paintings and photographs they're pretty shaggy they didn't worry about having their hair cut but they wanted that shave Shades. so it's the main thing but it, it was a chance for the customer to demonstrate that they were so in control that they had no reason to fear mm. the barber and the barber by playing along with that got himself developed a relationship so this is the the real uh, paradox at the heart of being a black barber in the 19th century serving white customers is on the one hand by serving prosperous men you're going to do well in business your wife's going to get a piano in the parlor um, you're going to be able to have other business opportunities but at the same time you always had to wear a mask mm. of deference and servility. Um, and so I have one passage in a, from, from some family papers. The rapiers were a family of barbers. Of a barber coming, some old colonel comes in and, you know, wants to smell his hands and are the towels clean? It just kind of walks him through this very, and he just plays along with it because he knows that's part of what, part of what the white customers were buying. Mm -hmm. was the sense of being waited on by someone who was their social inferior. They wanted a servant. And they weren't just any servant. I think we can get this to other questions, but what they're really uh, selling is gentility. Yeah. Right? Gentlemen were shaved. And of course, there are, as I discussed in the book, you know, the roots of barbers and this curious relationship they have with their customers goes all the way back to the barber of Seville. So, you know, what, what, what was defined mainly by class in Europe between aristocrats and common people uh, be, becomes defined by race in North America between white and black men. And so how did barbers, and I'm saying the black barbers, how did they become barbers? How did they get trained? And I think now in the 21st century, you go to school, you know, you get licensed or whatever. But what happened back during, you know, the 19th century? Okay, so uh, in general, so this is still the heyday of apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. And with an apprentice, um, at ages as young as nine or 10 years old, a family would bring their child 
to a master barber or a carpenter or a, um, you know, all sorts of different trades. And that young man would live in the house of, they call them masters. So whether they were free or not, so that that artisan was going to not only teach them the mysteries of the trade, but make sure they learned how to read and write and could keep books. And so they really effectively become a part of their family. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so striking um, is how does this begin in America? And of course, as we see in the first chapter of Knights of the Razor, it begins in slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so John Hope or Caesar Hope, we'll hopefully talk about him more. Yeah was some, a 10 year old boy who had just been bought off a slave ship in Virginia, but he had the good fortune to be bought by a merchant who among other businesses operated a wig making and barber shop. And mm-hmm. so he entered this household with mainly, uh, there were three London wig makers, free men. There was an indentured Irish, Amer- you know, Irish servant and him. And he's not only learning how to, take care of customers in a barbershop. It's also one advantage barbers had in the colonial period. They spent a lot of time interacting with white people. So they understood them in ways. Sure. If, if he had been an African slave and they had sent him, as they usually did, to some remote plantation where they were easily managed, you know, maybe it wouldn't be till the next generation that, the, that uh, these people would have the savvy to deal with whites who are dangerous people. Because if you get, ang- if they make, they get angry at you, they can kill you and get away with it. Sure. And that's a real basic issue. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting. And as a genealogist myself and, and the audience probably predominantly are researchers, genealogists, we come across, and if we're doing African-American genealogy research, we have our challenges. And there's numerous challenges. And um, I'm well over 30 some years as a researcher and yes, we're daily challenges. So what type, since you focused, and I'm gonna say on the occupation, which typically a lot of us don't do, we know occupation, but we're not researching that line. And I just think we, we're missing out on a part if we don't look a little bit you know, deeper on the, what records and resources might be associated with this business and, and your example, the barbering. So what challenges did you face in conducting this research? And I'll say occupation, you know, towards occupation. You know, um, that's a question I was often asked when I was working on the book. And, you know, I mm-hmm. said, in some ways, this was like looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. <laughs> yes. um, because, frankly, due to racism, white people were just much less likely to document anything at all, as, as researchers know, about uh, the lives of free or enslaved uh, African Americans. And uh, so I had two general strategies. Um, one was going through all these local histories to identify people who were prominent and see if they then had left, a, uh, you know, William Johnson of Natchez left a, a 20,000 word diary that's the longest single document written by an African American before the Civil War and tells you everything there is to know about Annabelle Natchez. Others, the Thomas Rapier family left papers at, at Howard University. So you have good fortunes like that. But in terms of understanding the, the bigger picture and in terms of actually trying to identify people who are obscure otherwise, uh, I went through uh, the census returns because they do list occupation. Sure. And sadly, sure. that was before Ancestry.com had all those records online. So I had to sit in the National Archives down in the mall and go through the microfilm. And sure. you can just simply scan the occupation column. Mm-hmm. And this, so it's occupation of race. And so I and, did and, that for yeah. Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Mobile, mm-hmm. starting in 1850 and going through the rest of the century. And then, of course, once you identify people, uh, for example, in Mobile, I was able to go look up property tax records to mm-hmm. identify what businesses different barbers own and, you know, trace them in other ways. But so it just, it's very resourcefulness. But I ended up decided that it's not really about looking for needles in a ha- haystack because let's face it, uh, if you've ever known a barber, they're a lot of fun. You wouldn't be a barber if you're boring. So I realized what I was really doing because they're so enjoyable to get to know that it was really more like panning for gold than looking for needles in a haystack. Yeah, and and you mentioned the census and things. And so for those that are new to genealogy, 
uh, people that were enslaved are typically not recognized in those earlier census. There is a slave schedule. They'll be identified by their race, their age, and their gender. And um, but you might not see the occupation, and unless they're free. And if they're free, not enslaved, then yes, we'll be able to see those. So I think we got, again, another way to focus in and zero in to enhance our research, you know, looking at the specialty occupations, I'll say, because it could be brick masons, barbers, and so forth. And I just think it's fascinating. Throughout the book, it comes up. Um, about the relationship, and we we keyed in a little bit on it earlier, and and that to me puts a, that trust factor keeps coming up with someone you know enslaved, you know the master, the owner, and um, yes, every couple of weeks I'm going to the barber per se, but is there more that you can say about that relationship that these blacks and whites had? because it's not necessarily their enslaved person that's cutting their hair. They could be going to another person that's not owned by them. Is that correct? And getting their hair cut and stuff. Okay. Can you explain a little bit more about what you saw in the research as far as that relationship between the white and the black? Yeah, certainly. Um, before I do that, let me just say one thing I should have mentioned before, there would be a good res resource for your genealogist. If you know the occupation, you can yeah. use city directories, yes. which have index, indexes by occupation. So that's, a, and then you find out an address where they live. And mm -hmm. so that's something that can very quickly kind of help you reconstruct the household. Um, in terms of talking about these black white relationships between barbers and their customers that go from the colonial period all the way into the 20th century, let me just briefly mention four barbers. Mm -hmm. um, so the first was a, a slave named Nassau who belonged to a very, very wealthy Virginia planter, Landon Carner, who we know about, a lot about because he left a large diary. And in that diary, he mentioned Nassau 50 times, um, more than some of his children. And that's mm. because of two things. One, Nassau, so he was a slave, but he was really more like his major domo. Um, Nassau would inspect crops, he would keep track of the number and the livestock, um, branding them. So he, in many ways, had become Landon Carner's right-hand man, his lieutenant on the plant. He, he also would provide medical care uh, to not only just to enslaved people, but to Carter's own children. Mm -hmm. um, so he was this trusted person. And this is the role. So barbering in America really came out of these people, NASA, who were sometimes called slave valets. So, and part of this is, think about it, the clothing, part of being a gentleman was you had to wear a wig and you're wearing imported silk clothing from Europe. So it needs to, a lot of care to, to pull off the look. So you would need help to do this. And so that was the role of these slave ballets. Part of that, just before I leave him behind, Nassau was trusted, but he was always incredibly frustrated because he had a really bad drinking habit. And I think oh. that's, a sign of him drinking, uh, uh, the drinking is a sign of him coping with the stress mm -hmm. of being under this person's eye who's very demanding all the time. And so, you know, what I concluded from Carter again and again, expressing his frustration with someone who is an alcoholic is that it's, it's about his failure to completely control the people in his household, that that frustrated him. All right, the next person I want to talk about is William Johnson, the, who I mentioned before was the famous barber of Natchez. So his biography has been, or his on di diary rather, has been published. Uh, so that's something people could find in a library probably near them. So he has an interesting relationship. It's not with a customer, it's with his white father. He was named after William Johnson, who had purchased his mother and essentially was living openly with her, which was not that uncommon in 1830. Mississippi's really part of the frontier. Uh, and so when William Johnson reached the age of 10, uh, at that point, Mississippi had placed so many restrictions. Only 1% of Black people in Mississippi were free in 1850, mm. uh, that you had to actually get the legislature to pass a law 
to free an individual person from slavery. And his father did it. And he indicated because, um, you know, his, his sentiments towards the young man were such he couldn't bear to see him in slavery. So in other words, this is my child. And he was the one that made sure he got an apprenticeship with, strangely enough, a free Black man from uh, Philadelphia had moved to Natchez, moved to the heart of the slave kingdom because it was good business for him. And he's the one that taught uh, William Johnson uh, barbering. And his father passes away fairly on early on, but he develops very close relationships with other leading planners in the area. And they're crucial for him because he can't sue people in court if they won't pay their bills. Uh, he, he goes on and buys land. He, he ends up owning 34 slaves himself over the course of his lifetime. Um, and so with, with William Johnson, he really was someone who was very careful about who he kept company with because as I argue in the book, and this was, not, I'm not the only person who noticed this, free black uh, men especially would try to win respect by living up to the standards of class. So William Johnson wanted to live like a gentleman and have a farm like a gentleman and that way to win the respect of the better sort of people in the South. Okay, that's very different um, than John Merrick. So we're, we're skipping a forward to the late 19th century in North Carolina. John Merrick was born just years before the end of slavery. So he probably would have been four or five when uh, emancipation came. And um, he got out of the countryside as soon as he could, became a mason, helped build Shaw College in Raleigh. But then he got working as a barber because he realized it was a lot less work than being a brick mason. And while he was there, um, John, uh, John Buck Duke, the founder of the Duke Tobacco, American Tobacco Monopoly, mm -hmm. took a shine to young John Merrick and encouraged him to relocate to Durham where he lived so he'd have a good barber. And he, I think he actually probably loaned Merrick the money. Uh, to open a barber shop, Merrick ends up ends up opening three shops for white customers and several shops for black customers. He also goes on to found the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, which before the end of segregation was the largest black-owned corporation in the world. And when people were asked about where did Merrick get this incredible business savvy, essentially what they would say is, well. He's dealing with Buck Duke. This is the guy who founded the use of billboards. So he's getting the equivalent of an MBA talking to these architects of the New South, all these industrialists uh, who were his customers. And in fact, the, the legend has it that Duke encouraged Merrick to found the uh, insurance corporation. Uh, then finally, in that same time period, but this is in the North, in Cleveland, Ohio, is, is George Myers. So George Myers was born in Baltimore, but decided um, to relocate to Cleveland right at the time that John D. Rockefeller was consolidating his hold on, on the oil refining that was located in Cleveland. So this is a boom town at the time. He gets very involved in Republican politics. So develops a close relationship with a customer, Mark Hanna, who was essentially the the person behind the throne of William McKinley getting nominated for uh, the Republican nomination and winning the election as president. George Myers is so influential among black Republican delegates that he's given credit for making that happen. And then of course, that relationship with politician comes pays off for him when later on, there's a movement by a largely immigrant white union of barbers to drive black barbers of the trade and he's able to use his political influence to forestall that movement for a generation so these relationships change with the time but it's about you know mutual respect in some ways but always a sense of inferiority uh he Myers had a a customer who moved away but insisted on mailing him his old used bow ties and you know here's Myers he's got nice cars and he's got lots of money but he's still going to take the mm -hmm. uh, bow tie and write this benefactor that he's going to clean him up with a little elbow grease and he's so grateful to get them um so that's just they had to live within real constraints but it did benefit them in the long run 
So we definitely see a little bit, based on what you're saying, a competition between white barbers and black barbers too. It, it sounds like it. So, so um, one of the terms that you used in the book is that the black barbers developed a conception of respectability and it linked to, you know, it's based on that economic independence. So I think that's a great lead into what you just explained a little bit about the business. And so could you explain the conception of respectability that the Black Barbers developed? Certainly. And I should just say, just in general, and probably the people listening to us know about this, but this was a major thrust of racial uplift in the 19th century, the whole idea of lifting as we climb, so if the the talented tenth is Du Bois, whatever. So if people who were most successful and could get education and middle class jobs by mm -hmm. conducting themselves the way white middle class people uh, did, that they would change the way white people viewed the black community, um, and this causes problems for black barbers because black barbers can't serve black customers. If they do, all their white customers will leave them. And so in as early as 1848, there were there was a colored convention movement. By the way, if anybody has ancestors who were involved in uh, antebellum northern abolitionist movements or anything like that, these have all been published and they have great indexes. So it'd be you'd probably be surprised who you could find in there. But they denounced barbers because they wouldn't serve respectable black men. And then Frederick Douglass took it even a step farther. Because he said, and he's thinking back to his experience as, as someone who caulked ships for a living and made decent uh, money. And that's hard work and respectable or being a farmer is hard work. But he said, what do barbers do? They lay around all day waiting for customers. And when they get there, they fawn all over them. They conduct themselves. If we're trying to get past the image of the only thing Black people are fit for is to be servants. You know, mm -hmm. barbers are going against that. And barbers then and later responded very harshly because they said, uh, I think John Merrick uh, said it best in a speech after the Wilmington riot in 1898. If you want to be, if you want to uh, be represented, if you want to represent, you have to have something to represent. In other words, you have to own mm -hmm. things. And so barbers are like, our businesses support people you know, let our wives stay at home and take care of our children. We donate money to churches and benevolent orders. And many of them were ministers or, or leaders of local organizations. And they said, we can't do anything until we have economic independence, which gives us the means to try to pursue respectability. So, so it's very interesting, but, and you mentioned the North and the South regarding the barbers. Was it different environments in the North and the South for the barbers? Were, were they, I don't wanna say just treated differently, but in your research, did you see a difference between what was going on in the North versus the South with the barbers? I guess I'll say it that way. Sure, yeah. I mean, there's actually a whole chapter uh, in the book, yeah. Regional Origins of Black Barbers, because not only were there dramatic differences between North and South, but within the South, you have the upper south of the border states along the border with the north. And then you have the actual deep south, which had been the heart, you know, which was where the cotton kingdom was located. And those were very, very different situations. So in the north, we're talking about um, free people after 1820. If all people are free and those barbers are able to participate in movements on behalf of Black people, like the mm -hmm. very prominent abolitionists, like John Vachon of Pittsburgh. Um, and they are also in Boston, I've found cases where Black barbers were able to serve white and Black clientele because of enlightened racial attitudes. George mm -hmm. Myers in Cleveland lived in a white neighborhood, mm -hmm. sent his kids to white schools because it's very small. And what this comes from, historians think is, there's a threshold. So if, if a minority population remains below, usually it's about 25, 30%, people aren't as worried about establishing boundary lines between them. Mm -hmm. um, and so until you have the great migration 
in the during World War starting World War One, you don't really have the black populations in the north. That so segregation gets worse in the north later as more black people go there. Now in the south, there's a really striking difference. So William Johnson, who I've talked about, was in the deep south, the deepest mm -hmm. of the deep south, Natchez, Mississippi. That it's you know when it was the Saudi Arabia of cotton. Only one percent of blacks are free. Um, and as I mentioned before, he really is in many ways very socially isolated because he's trying to keep himself separate from slaves, uh, but cannot be accepted by the white men he admires. So he's a, a number, he mainly associates with uh, other white, with white immigrant business people were his closest mm -hmm. friends. Um, where barbering really flourished was in the upper South. And I think that had to do with a couple of things. So that was an area where after the American Revolution, slavery really declined. Um, there had been a shift away from tobacco crops, which needed were labor intensive. As the mid-Atlantic area gets more into cereal crops, they simply didn't need slave labor as much. That's mm -hmm. why so many of them went into trades because they could be hired out by their master, which lets many people become barbers. And um, I'm just going through different studies of free blacks and wealth. I mean, that's where you found the the you found more black business owners in the Upper South, and the the most common one was black barber. So that was and that that area is really interesting, also because those are the people who emigrate. So George Myers comes from that area and then goes off to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're spreading this tradition. I think what it had to do is with. Um, you don't have a, you're not surrounded by a black majority the way you are in Mississippi. So black people are less threatening. Uh, and at the same time, black barbers don't, because there's not such heightened suspicion that a free black person is gonna overthrow slavery, that they can also maintain close uh, connections to the entire African-American community, including enslaved people. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was just a better environment to, to live and be a person. Okay, so so could the barbers during the plantation era time, did they have other duties that they had to do for their owners, you know, and even during Civil War time, and I think I mentioned the term in your book was plantation lieutenant, and I want to know how that was viewed throughout, you know, uh, on the plantation and any other duties besides cutting hair. Right. Well, uh, when I was talking about Nassau, Landon Carter's uh, slave valet in the colonial period, that was the heyday of where a barber actually lived on the plantation of his master and had a variety of duties. What happens by the revolution is as slavery is declining. So this is centered around the Chesapeake Bay is where kind of black barbers emerge uh, as that area shifts away from uh, crops, staple crops that require slave labor, uh, that those skilled barbers are allowed to hire themselves out. Ah, okay. okay, so that's how people like Caesar or John Hope is able mm -hmm. to eventually get his freedom. He's been very, he doesn't have to buy his freedom. Most, most uh, slave barbers do buy their freedom. Bye. Um, so that's the real connection there. Okay. So, so thinking about barbers, and again, I'm during the slave era time and coming forward, was there any connections with the Black barbers in the Underground Railroad? Uh, yeah, uh, I think his name is Peter Hedrick in, in Boston, uh, was known for, uh, he was actually the, on the board of the Anti-Slavery Society, which was dramatically burned down by an anti-abolitionist. Uh, mob in the 1840s, but he was known to hide people who were escaping through the Underground Railroad. I also had a case where the um, son, one of the one of the Rapier Thomas brothers, had what what often was really sad. Barbers could use their earning power to buy their freedom, mm -hmm. but they might might not have the money or their might not have 
the ability to persuade the owners of their wives and children to sell them. And so in this instance, this young man was actually smuggled up to Buffalo because the, his father had, John Thomas had not been able to buy his freedom. And so he was actually smuggled away rather than when the master died, there was a fear the, that he would be sold down the river from St. Louis. So one of the chapters in your book is called Defining the Meaning of Freedom. That perspective from the barber, how, how did you see that? And, and you talk in depth about it in the book, but I'd like the, you know, the audience to hear, you know, that defining the meaning of freedom for that black barber or, or even their family. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, this has been the real insight of a lot of great studies in emancipation in the last 30 years, is that it's more than just a matter of uh, you can be bought or sold or you cannot be bought and sold, because um, it's not clear at all what the status of formerly enslaved people is going to be after the Civil War. So it's, it's a contest. And what's become really clear as we've done research that's, that's better at hearing the voices at the grassroots Mm. is that, you know, former slaves had their own idea of what freedom would mean. Um, so for barbers, what they were looking for was the freedom to run, their, operate their business without being unduly uh, controlled or obligated to other white men. So finally now, if they're, someone doesn't pay their debt, they can take them to court. Mm -hmm. uh, and their skill at uh, dealing as essentially being emissaries between the white and the black race, I think explain why so many barbers went into reconstruction politics. So Joseph Rainey, for example, who is a free black man from Charleston, family owned a barber shop. Uh, during the war, he got drafted uh, to serve as a steward, which is like a servant on a Confederate mm -hmm. blockade runner. Um, he gets back, then he gets drafted to help build fortifications in the harbor. And he's had enough of this. So he takes off to Bermuda for the rest of the war. And but then when he returns, this man, Joseph Rainey, is the first African-American elected to Congress. And the point is that they they have established relationships with the white elite. They know how to deal with this incoming uh, elite from the north that's going to bring Republican Party politics there. So, you know, they're able to form this bridge that. Uh, you know, without power, freedom mm -hmm. means nothing. And so politics are essential and barbers were essential to creating a black politics because they could make the connections to white men in the political establishment. And what's interesting and in, in what you mentioned earlier that the whites basically had that desire of the look you know, the shaving and, and this, that, and other. So in, in one sense, they're kind of doing a little bit of the same thing, but just in a, going down a different alley. You got the Blacks, you know, economic uh, independence, they're getting earned, they're well-respected. And then you got the Whites that want to be well-respected, have that look and this, that, and other. So it's almost like they're, they're doing the same thing. It's just viewed differently. So um, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, I read, which was interesting to me, but I kind of understand it, was the point of the Black barbers accommodating racial inequality. And it was, and I want to think that that's based on survival. Was there anything more that they followed or basically were included with the whites per se on the on the racial inequality and stuff. Can you share a little uh, bit? I'm not on sure that? I followed the last part of your question. Well, was it just survival that they're agreeing with what the white people believed? You know, maybe there's everything still separate, you know, and things like that. What did you see anything else in your studies besides them being able to survive, keep their business, their economic, you know, position or class, whatever you want to call it, as far as agreeing to everything being not equal 
in other words, the black man and the white man is still not seen equal, even though you got a person that got a well-respected profession. Right. And so was it really just survival in, in that aspect? I mean, to a great extent, it was survival. Um, you know, they were able to work year round inside, mm. and make cash money every day. I mean, there were not many jobs like that available to black men. Uh, several barbers, you know, who love papers talk about, oh, I want to do something else. But they always come back to barbering because it's just a reliable, stable, secure economic basis. But at the same time, as we saw with, uh, for example, William Johnson, um, he really looked up to his customers because they were men he idolized. They were the kind of paragons of, of planner society. And uh, so it's, it's, it's not surprising that men who grew up very poor and kind of made their own fortune would want to associate with the most successful business and political leaders in their community. And that's what barbering let them do as long as they kept polishing those used bow ties, you know, as long as they never presumed to act entirely equal. But the, what they could get in terms of, um, you know, economics was never segregated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. when, when, when there's money to be made, nobody worries about color lines in America. Right. Um, and so that was, they saw this as their opportunity. So coming into some of Jesse's questions, um, she basically is asking that, was there a difference between hairdressers and barbers in the Upper South before and after the 1700s through 1870s? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question because early on, um, remember in the colonial period, they're doing wigs. So right. in, at that point, dressing hair was much more important than it was in the 19th century. You know, people are coming in every mm -hmm. two, three days to get a shave is mainly why they're in the barber shop. Uh, so early on they were, and there's a famous example. I'm glad I have a chance to talk about because he's been naming, nominated for sainthood in the Catholic church. And his name is Pierre Toussaint. So mm -hmm. he had been essentially the slave ballet to a very wealthy family in what is now present day Haiti, which was then St. Dominique. And so when that white family, white French family fled Haiti after the successful revolt of the slave people there, they resettled in New York and he essentially supported them. Uh, and he did, uh, and part of the reason, it seems like he's being exploited, but what it is, is he's associated with these aristocratic French people that New York society was fascinated with. And that association let him get the business. He, he did serve mainly uh, women doing their hair that it, you know, that cachet allowed him to attract um, that clientele. Uh, later in the century, in the 19th century, we do see uh, gender specific. So mm -hmm. black men are serving white men as barbers, women are serving white women uh as hairdressers and that a lot of that has to do with uh a woman who would do that role for a white woman would also probably make her clothes or at least alter them repair them mm -hmm. uh, eliza keckley mm -hmm. uh, wrote a diary about basically she was mary todd lincoln's hairdresser and so you get a upstairs downstairs view of the lincoln white house before that mm -hmm. she talks about kind of scandals among the rich people she served in Saratoga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and more generally, I mean, there is a moment in the 1920s at the end, this is where I, my period, my book ends where we really have the great migration because then, then you see the, the creation of a modern barbershop we recognize where it's a black businessman <laughs> serving black customers in a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the 1920s, it was very popular for young women to get their hair bobbed. That was the look of flappers. And hairstyles didn't know how to do that. So they would go to barber shops. And there was a big controversy. Atlanta actually passed a law forbidding women to go into barber shops because they were worried that white women were going into their father, see their father's black barber. And that was scandalous <laughs> because the, you know, much of segregation was justified by mm -hmm. the obsession with preventing uh, interracial sex. 
In, in another one of her questions, and we'll get to the Q&A as well, um, she said, is there a way to find out names of individuals in fraternal and beneficial organizations between the period 1850 and 1920? I will reference here that we had James R. Morgan III on, and he talked about in his book, which was all about the benevolent societies and things. And if Karen Kay, if you can get a link to James' book and put in the chat, um, so Jesse and others that are interested will be able to access. But we do have a recording and did an interview with him about the benevolent societies and organizations back then, which will answer, you know, somewhat of her question. But she also is talking about finding banking records. And there's a large group of us that deal a lot with the Freedmen's Bureau and also the Freedmen Bank Bureau per se and looking at it. Were there any laws or anything where they couldn't set up accounts or anything like that? Or were you able to access, Could can we see the money that was being made you know, during their times if there were banking and so forth? Yeah, that's an and obvious I would want question. To point it to the 21st century to see how, you know, that economic independence, what they saw versus what we see now. So, right. Yeah, that's very revealing. Um, you know, there are some records of some banks that have survived. Um, mm -hmm. African Americans were able to open bank accounts, uh, but they're kind of few and far between. I have, my email address is douglas.bristol at uh, usm.edu so it's my first last name separated but period at usm.edu if the person with that question must contact me I, I recently reviewed a manuscript about uh, banks that were used by uh, black people in Baltimore after the uh, civil war okay. but really the, the thing to look for is property records yeah. this is something I wrote about um, this is because in English common law there are really strong guarantees that your property cannot be, your real property cannot be taken away from you. And so that was overwhelmingly where barbers put their money, rental property, agricultural mm -hmm. land. And that, as long as you know who he is, you can go look up, like I was talking about doing in the three cities, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Mobile, go through the tax records, because then you can identify everything that they own. And in, in during the, the time frame of, and of course, the barbering continuing is on today, did the slave owners ever rent them out, their barbers, to other plantation owners? You know, there's such a system and a lot of money that's been made. Was that skill a skill that was rented out or hired out? Yeah, I mean, that's really how the hiring out started would be, you know, Landon Carver would have a neighbor and said, hey, we're going to have a big shindig and can you send Nassau down here to shave the boys at the plantation and they would have to pay him uh, right. for that money. Um, but I mean, the association between barbering and slavery really doesn't last into right. the history of this country. That's more of a colonial phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Well, it's just want to know if they hired them out, basically. Right. Um, you know, did you see records of that? Because that system of renting those enslaved laborers out is very prevalent, especially in Virginia. I just have not noted any of them being barbers. That you know, it was more right. Um, so where you would labor. see the money was in the petition that would be filed for their freedom. Uh, Often, if they had. Uh, made some arrangement to pay their owner for their freedom, the owner would lay that out. Um, and so that is something, there is a project I worked on with my master's advisor, uh, Dr. Lauren Schweninger, uh, the Race, Slavery and Free Blacks project. We went through petitions to county courts and state legislatures in the antebellum period in the slaveholding South. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's where you can find, so this is something that's available online that you can find um, you know, anything like that, like a petition for emancipation, we would have picked that out. So that's one way to get at these things. Yeah, the Library of Virginia in Richmond has a large collection online that people can view of legislative petitions, people petitioning to stay in Virginia. And so, yeah, it's a wealth of information. 
So are there similarities in today's barbers? And you mentioned a little bit versus something, you know, back during, you know, in the 1800s and things like that. Yeah, I'm glad you're asking this question because it, it, I haven't got around to explaining the title of the book yet. Why did yes. they, where does Knights of the Razor come from anyways? Well, that was actually a term uh, they used. I found uh, there was a barber, Scipion Clamorgan in St. Uh, Louis, who published a book on the colored aristocracy of St. Louis. And surprise, a number of them were barbers. Yeah. Um, but what that really got at was that they were very proud. They hung on to the traditions of artisans that went back to Europe mm -hmm. and that they, to become a barber was to join a mutual aid society that would take care of you from your years as apprentice to help you get your own shop and then give you work or just uh, handouts if you needed it when you were very elderly. And I think that's what we really still see uh, that remains in common between barbers then and barbers now is a strong sense <coughs> of these men are joined in a network uh, to support each other, uh, to become independent, to be barbers. And in turn, part of being a barber has always involved being a leader within their own community. And I, I really see that now. One of the things that's very encouraging, you probably heard about this, a lot of public health programs that are targeting, say, they want to reach more out to Black men to make sure they get tested for hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of public health organizations have realized is the person to go to is the man's barber. Sure. And if sure. they can get him to, to promote information about a program, people are much more likely to overcome their admittedly understandable suspicion of the medical profession and go do things that would help themselves. And so I'm going to let Karen Kay get to the Q&A. Um, we've got some a few questions in there. And so Karen Kay. I have to unmute here. Here we go. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so discuss the interstate networking of Black barbers as it pertains to the master slash apprentice system. The interstate. I, I couldn't quite hear that question. I didn't need that. Okay. <clears throat> Can Dr. Bristol discuss the interstate networking of Black barbers as it pertains to the master slash apprentice system? Okay. Um, so what I saw in the 19th century is, well, I saw two things in the 19th century. First is informal networking across state lines because apprentices, you know, every, everybody in America is going West, right? Go West, young men. So sure, they do that sure. as well. And so they'll still be in contact. Apprentices will be passed along through, um, you know, people who have this connection of having worked together in the past. So that's an informal system. Uh, however, in the late 19th century, uh, there's a, a, a union that for a time has a lot of black members, the Journeyman Barbers International Union of America. Um, and so, you know, they're actually bar black barbers coming from around the country, including the South, going to national union. This is an AFL, American Federation of Labor Affiliated Union. Um, and of course, I think they're, the real network between states was through politics. Uh, because even in the South, I mean, in the South, the Republican Party, after the end of Reconstruction, is essentially a party made up of Black men. Um, right. And they're very important, as we've seen, for things like nominating the who's going to be the Republican nominee. And so that was a network that barbers and other businessmen, more t undertakers, restaurateurs would have joined. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Next question. Can you describe more in depth, if you can, the mask that the Black Barber wore. You mentioned that earlier about them wearing a mask. Sure. Um, you know, not to put too fine of a point on it, but I mean, they're really having to play Sambo, that stereotype. Mm -hmm. uh, it, one thing that's really kind of mind boggling <laughs> when you read through the records of 19th century white people, not only Southerners, but Northerners, is they just seem to lack the ability to see black people as people like themselves. And so unfortunately they just viewed people through the lens of these stereotypes that these people are kind of happy-go-lucky, 
and they like to have fun. They don't want to work too hard, you know, so all these negative stereotypes that we hate. Mm -hmm. And the problem was that the barber didn't did something that didn't fit with that. That was going to attract immediate comment. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can see why this was really demoralizing for men to have to do this every single day they went to work. But, you know, what was the alternative, really? Okay, next question. Could you talk a bit more about the economics of a slave as proprietor of a paying business? Who provided the capital to start up and to whom did the revenues flow? Um, and are there examples um, of Knights of the Razor who went on to buy their freedom, which, which you covered, but yeah questions is sure um <laughs> so one thing i should know like what i was talking about the deep south were different most bar black barbers in the deep south were slaves mm. often owned by white barbers uh and some so some or even william johnson had a slave barber he had a second shop mm. and he just let this slave barber run the shop for him and he th so the slave would have to turn over most of the money from the shop um, I'm trying to, what was the other part of that? Oh, wait. The concept, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> wait, I'll get it real quick. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and who provided the um, capital to start up? To start oh, up right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is another reason why you really had no choice if you wanted to go into business to have these white paternalistic figures because in most cases, uh, they're favorite customers would loan them the money to open the barber shop. And these weren't, um, these weren't gifts, right? These were business relationships. They had to pay them back. Um, but that was where they were going to get it. And the reality is if a black man wanted to get a lease, they were very often associated with first class hotels mm -hmm. um, in central business districts there's no way you would would be able to lease that space without some white person vouching to you to the white owner of that establishment so i mean the, the way to look at it is is that whites have monopolized all economic opportunity so the only way to get any of it really is to have a relationship with somebody in that arena okay next question you mentioned that manhood might be equated with having property and business ownership as part of respectability in the 19th century for Blacks and whites. Do you think this concept of occupation and owning a home is still part of racism today? Well, I mean, I saw manhood as being defined by being a good bread, being able to be a breadwinner was part of the way Blacks thought of respectability. I didn't really see that. That was a way to try to fight racism by showing that they could, you know, that they could have their wife be at home, they could buy a piano in the living room, their kids would go to school to through high school. Uh, so it was a way to fight racism, but it was so much, not so much a cause of it. Um, of course, you know, as I mentioned, people like Frederick Douglass said um, that they were being unmanly, that they were acting, they were, you know, they were letting their customers treat them like children and not, you know, manly men wouldn't do that. I, I will say, let's take a couple more questions. Um, we're running through our time. And and again, just remind people that are here, this is recorded and it will be placed on the um, YouTube channel for the International African American Museum. So you will have the chance to reply it. And I saw that that was one question. Uh, so let's do a couple more, um, Karen Kay. or I can do them, she's on mute. Uh, did you target any specific communities Sorry. in which you researched? And you mentioned that you did Baltimore and a couple other places, um, but their question was, did you target spe any specific communities in which you searched for the occupations of African-Americans? Right, so yeah, I had picked Philadelphia, Baltimore and Mobile because they, respectively represented the North, the Upper South, and the Lower South. Right. And that's where I went through, you know, everything, the census records, city directories. Okay. 
Um, one question regarding back to uh, Mr. Merrick. Did it continue after he started his insurance business? Yeah, I mean, he um, lived a fairly long, happy life. So he was very diversified. So he had the insurance company, which after about 10 years was extremely successful, but he still ran barbershops for whites, barbershops for blacks. He owned a lot of rental property. He got involved with the National Negro Business League, which uh, Booker T. Washington had founded. Um, so he became a national figure by the end of his life uh, when he passed away in the 1940s. Okay. And somebody wanted to know, when you said that the barbers had to wear a mask for eye cup, the, cup, the eye area, was is it similar to like the COVID mask that we have now, or is it a full face Oh, no, by mask, that's just a metaphor. They're not actually okay. wearing a mask. It just means you can't you can't show people it's like, wow, you're just this white racist asshole. Right. You know, right. so you have to be like, oh, I'm so happy you're here today. I'm sorry your towel wasn't hot enough this morning. You know, it's we know that mask. If you've ever waited tables or things like that, it's that sure. you're you aim to please, no matter how okay. annoying the people are. And I think you already answered this one about. In any given community, how many black barbers would you find in one place? Basically, did the black barbers have their own territory in which they had clients? That's a really good question. Um, I think that's where the mutual aid aspect of barbering really paid off because a family usually would have a couple of members going to barbering and they would take some apprentices so you get a couple more shops, but then they were more likely to send people on to different cities. So there was a real effort to make sure there wasn't too much competition. And I know from talking to barbers today, that's a real concern they have in the 21st century is there's mm -hmm. just too many barbers for not enough customers. And can you probably, you probably do know, maybe you don't know, approximately how much did the barber get paid for a shave and a haircut? Um, so after the Civil War, you'd be paying maybe a dime for a shave, 25 mm -hmm. cents for a haircut. Uh, but you might also buy other things. You might uh, pay to have, hmm. they had public bathhouses because not right. everybody had indoor right. plumbing. Mm -hmm. um, you could get a massage. Um, you could buy uh, the nicer, these first class shops, you know, they sold cufflinks and collars and cologne mm -hmm. and cigars. So kind of anything men wanted was retailed in a barber shop. So they sold a variety of services. So in a way, you know, shaving is like a loss leader just to get the people to come in the shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the next, there's two more questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna merge them. How long did, did you research this topic? And researching Charleston, South Carolina, what sources did you use to find the barber population? Okay, uh, all told, I think I spent uh, six years doing the research for this book. Mm -hmm. And it just had to be really creative as, as sure. genealogists know. Um, in terms of South Carolina, I mainly relied in South Carolina. There are excellent histories of, of individuals and, and the communities in Atlanta and Charleston. So I drew on other people's work for a lot of that, that information. Mm -hmm. So I'll take it from here, Karen Kay. <laughs> One last question to you. What do you hope people take away from your book? You did six years of research. <clears throat> you know, what, if there's one thing you want people to go away with, what is it? And you know, this is a typical question. Interview. No, I mean, but to be fair, I've been asked this a few times. Um, <laughs> I think the one thing I hope people really take away from this is, you know, lately, uh, for good reasons, like the Black Lives Matter movement, we've been focusing right. on how whites have victimized African-Americans. But one thing you get from these barbers is, you know, here they were in the middle of plantation slave districts. And, you know, they had the just determination that they were gonna rise above their circumstances, that they had every right to be successful. And they did it again, generation after generation. and. And, you know, some of the most difficult years African-Americans ever had to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, they were consistently successful and not only helped themselves, but helped the rest of their community. And that's, you know, I think in light of 
slavery and Jim Crow, the fact that people did that is really amazing. I don't think we honor that enough. Right. And, and it's interesting in our research, we find uh, no matter what community it is, your barbershops, your hairdressers and things, that's the hub. That's where oh, yeah. information is flowing. That's where information is being shared. And so definitely a very fascinating topic. And again, Dr. Bristol, appreciate your time being here with us. We thank you.